Uh, everyone, today, inshallah, what I want to share with you is one of the most important lessons that I learned from my teacher, one of my teachers, Dr. Akram Nadwi, not too long ago. This was less than two years ago that I heard him, uh, you know, give an introductory talk about something that I thought I understood and I knew pretty well. But actually, in the course of just a couple of hours, my view on a lot of things just completely changed. And it really, really helped me. And I, you know, I thought I've been studying the religion and trying to understand the Book of Allah for, you know, almost 15 years. Maybe I understand some things, but there are just some things that Allah opens the, the, the minds and the insights of some of his slaves. And they're able to see things in a way that help you maybe feel like I, I thought I know nothing. You know, and it's and they're discussing some basic thing that you might think you know, but really, subhanAllah, at the end of the day, it's absolutely remarkable. So I want to share a summary of some of those lessons with you that I found so profound and so, so very helpful, inshallah. Uh, what you see on the screen is not a picture of my eyeballs. Uh, it is, uh, it's actually a strange attempt at kind of giving you a visual of what I'm going to talk about. There's a very small circle, then a one outside of it is a little bigger, then bigger, then bigger, then bigger, then bigger, right? So that's the image that we're gonna be working with. Uh, and basically we're gonna try to understand our religion, Islam itself, a bigger picture of our religion in this way. At the, at the core of it, at the heart of our religion, the smallest circle that is at the center of everything is basically what you can call the usul of our deen, the essence the fundamentals, the original principles of our religion. The, the essential principles of our religion. At the end of the day, our religion is actually a set of principles. And the way you can think about these principles is what does Allah want from a human being? What does God want from a human being? What are the qualities? What are the attitudes? What are the emotions? What are the thoughts? What are the beliefs that a human being should have? And if you want to know what these essentials are, the way that Allah does that in the Quran is very beautiful. He does that with the words لَعَلَّكُمْ He does that with the words لَعَلَّكُمْ So he'll tell you something, something, something لَعَلَّكُمْ تَتَّقُونَ لَعَلَّكُمْ تَشْكُرُونَ لَعَلَّكُمْ تَذَكَّرُونَ لَعَلَّكُمْ تَعْقِلُونَ So that you remember, so that you're grateful, so that you have taqwa, so that you think, so that you reflect. All of those are fundamental qualities a human being should have. A human being should be a person of reflection. A, a, a human being should be a person of thought. A human being should be a person of remembrance. A human being should be a person of taqwa, of consciousness of Allah. A human being should be a person of gratitude. لَعَلَّكُمْ تَشْكُرُونَ So that you can be grateful. You got it? So these, when Allah, whenever Allah says لَعَلَّكُمْ and He mentions these verbs, these are qualities that we have to bring into our life. These are the essentials of our religion. I am a slave to Allah successfully if I'm able to bring these qualities into my life. Now I'll just, I won't list all of them, but just a handful, I just mentioned them, I'll repeat them to be able to think clearly. لَعَلَّكُمْ تَعْقِلُونَ لَعَلَّكُمْ تَشْكُرُونَ So you can be grateful. لَعَلَّكُمْ تَذَكَّرُونَ So you can be people of remembrance. So you can make efforts to remember, you know. لَعَلَّكُمْ تَتَّقُونَ So you can protect yourselves. You can save yourselves from trouble, be cautious, right? All of these, and of course, لَعَلَّكُمْ تُفْلِحُونَ So you can succeed in your afterlife. You know, Allah says, لَعَلَّكُمْ تُفْلِحُونَ quite often. So these are some of the fundamental qualities. Another way Allah describes the usul of our religion, what does Allah want from a human being? Is through the words, إِنَّ اللَّهَ يُحِبُّ or وَاللَّهُ يُحِبُّ Allah loves. Allah will say, Allah loves muttaqeen, Allah loves muhsineen. Allah loves and he, He'll add several qualities. And these are people, these are, these are you know, enhancements to yourself and to myself that we want to bring into our lives. And finally, Allah will say, Inna Allah ma'a, Allah is with. Right? So there's la'allakum, there's Allah yuhibbu, Allah loves, and then there is inna Allah ma'a. What does ma'a mean? Yeah, fa inna Allah ma'al muhsineen, inna Allah ma'al ladhina attaqaw, wa ladhina hum, you know, bi rabbihim yu'minun. So these are the qualities that are the usul of our deen. Basically, that's the essence of our religion. All right. Now, these are what I call principles, or I even call them fundamental principles. These are the fundamental principles. They are inspired directly by the word of Allah itself. Is that clear? Okay. Now, the thing with principles is that they are abstract. They are ideas. Being grateful, I don't know what that means. Having taqwa. I've heard so many like talks about taqwa, you have to increase your taqwa, increase your taqwa, increase your taqwa. Is it on sale outside? Can I get it somewhere? Can I eat something that will increase my taqwa? I just, how do I know if I have low taqwa or high taqwa? I don't understand. You know, or you have to increase your iman, or you have to increase your tawakkul. These are abstract ideas, you know. 
And how do we bring them practi practically into our life? In order for us to be able to do that, that's the next circle. The next circle is actually the, the, the fundamental obligations and the fundamental prohibitions. The fundamental obligations and the fundamental prohibitions. For example, uh, we have five pillars in the religion, yes? Everybody's clear about those. Now the thing is, for example, Salah. Salah is an obligation. But actually, it is an obligation that fulfills one of the essentials. Remember, the principles are the most important thing. And even the obligations Allah will give us, the point of them, the purpose of them, is to reinforce a principle. For example, Allah says, أَقِمِ الصَّلَاةَ لِذِكْرِ Establish Salah to remember me. Is remembering Allah a fundamental principle? It is. How do you practically bring the remembrance of Allah in your life so that it, in a way that pleases Allah? Well, the ultimate way to do that is what? Salah. So Salah took the abstract idea of remembering Allah and brought it into a practical reality. Allah says about fasting, كَمَا كُتِبَ عَلَى الَّذِينَ مِن قَبْلِكُمْ لَعَلَّكُمْ تَتَّقُونَ Fasting was given to you so you could have taqwa. Taqwa is abstract. Can you give me some practical exercise that I can do? Some practical ritual that I can follow that can actually bring that abstract into my life? What is that practice? Fasting is one of those practices. What you're going to find is every single obligation that Allah gave, fundamental obligation that Allah gave, it reinforces what? One of the principles. It's there to bring that principle into our life. Now what unfortunately has happened in our ummah is that we've separated the ahkam of Allah from their principles. So people are fasting, but they have no idea that the purpose of fasting is to develop taqwa. People are praying, but they're not clear about the fact that prayer actually has certain purposes. Not only its, not, it's purpose is not only that it's an obligation, its purpose is to fulfill and bring those principles into your life. It's not prayer that will make us successful. It is those principles that will make us successful. It's prayers is a means to an end. You understand? Fasting is a means to an end. Now we have made the means and we have turned them into the end. That's a very serious problem. The Quran doesn't let you do that. The Quran, every time it'll describe an obligation, it'll tie it to its end. Tie it to the principle. We're the ones who separate it. We're the ones who cut it up. Okay? This, this clear so far? I'll give you another, by the way, it's not just obligations, it's also prohibitions, things we're not supposed to do. So for example, one of the things that Salah does is tanha anil fahsha'i wal munkar. It prevents from evil, it prevents from shamelessness, because shamelessness will get rid of one of the most fundamental qualities of gratitude, you know, of selflessness, of taqwa, you know, it'll remove them, so Salah will prevent you from them. And the things Allah forbade you from is the things that Allah, will, that if you do them, it will violate one of those principles. Every prohibition will violate one of those principles. It'll go back to the usul. Okay, that's our second circle, which is the major obligations and the major prohibitions. And up until now, between these two, there is basically no difference whatsoever among any scholar, any Muslim. We're all in complete agreement what these principles are. We're all in agreement what the major obligations are. Nobody's going to come along and say, I don't know, pork is not that halal, that, that, that haram. That's not going to happen. And if they do, they're insane because we know better. You understand? Now let's go one circle outside of that. One circle outside of that are the smaller recommendations. The lesser recommendations. Okay? These are, you can call them the sunan, the sunnahs of the Prophet ﷺ, or good deeds that the Quran talk about, talks about that can enhance your character, like lowering your voice, for example. Allah talks about lowering your voice or walking with humility, right? These are also, in a sense, they're enhancements to your character. Similarly, entering the masjid with your right foot, which is a sunnah, right? Or eating with your right hand and doing these small, 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 small things, they are enhancements, okay? Now you should be, you sh a human being should, their priority should be the principles. If they wanna bring principles into their life, what should they be focused on? The major obligations. If they're taking care of their major obligations, then they should enhance them a little better by adding some of these things that beautify your, like Salah is major obligation. Salah is major obligation. Dhikr after Salah is what? It's an enhancement. 
Dua after salah is an enhancement. Okay, so you're, now you've already made the major obligation, now you can further it a little more, right? Now, the idea of these enhancements, by the way, here also there is no disagreement. There is no disagreement. Qiyamul Layl is an enhancement. Praying Tahajjud is an enhancement. Extra fasting is an enhancement. You know? Uh, some of the adhkar for traveling, the dhikr for walking into your home. It's not haram for you to walk into your home without dua. It's not haram for you to travel without the dua. But it's, it's good for you, isn't it? It enhances your deen. It betters you. So these are things that improve your, your life. Okay? That's number three. But, but before I get to number four, I, I, have to understand, I have to help you understand something about number three. One and two, one and two are actually what the prophets gave da'wah to. The prophets invited people to one and two, which means they called people to these principles and they called people to their major obligations and the major prohibitions. That is the fundamental da'wah of prophets. When people accepted that call and they internalized it and they absorbed it and they were good at it, then the prophets would give them tarbiyah and give them some additional enhancements. You with me? Now what do we do? What we do is, we put all of these, we actually forget principles, we don't even know what that is anymore. Major obligations and enhancements, we've mixed them together and we've basically, if you're very serious about Islam, then all of them are major obligations to you. So if you see someone, for example, praying dhuhr and not praying sunnah, then you'll run after them. Huh. What are you doing? In other words, now we enforce people to follow the enhancements. And if they're not following the enhancements, then we run after them. We question the way that they prayed or we question what they did or didn't do. You know, for example, even tajweed. Tajweed is not in the second circle. Tajweed is in the third circle. But what do we do? Your salah doesn't even count. You're not reciting, you're getting sin for reciting Quran. No, you're not getting sin for reciting Quran. You should learn tajweed. You should try to improve it. But if you're sitting there counting how many, how many lengths were the muds and how long was the qalqala, this was not how sahaba did it. This was not. It should be. You should be improving it, absolutely. But when you turn these things, these things that were supposed to be enhancements, their beautification, their decoration for your home. You know, your home needs a door. It needs a lock. Your home needs windows for air circulation. But your home does not need the kind of car the extra kind of carpet. It does not need paintings on the wall. They're nice to have. It adds comfort. Ad putting the sofa adds comfort. But you can't tell people you don't have a house. You don't have a real house if you don't have paintings in there. You can't do that to people. And you know when you do that to people, do most people even make a distinction between the enhancements and the major obligations? No, they don't. So when you criticize them on one, they put them on equal level as everything else. You understand? And when you do that, you have turned people away from Allah's deen. I'll give you a serious, serious uh, uh, implication of this. So for some people, for example, um, virtually everything is haram. Like virtually everything is haram. Uh, and so they'll tell somebody, you know, by the way, video games, haram. For example, you can't play video games, they're haram. You can't watch TV, it's haram. You can't, are you listening to the radio? That's haram. They'll just haram, haram everything. Now, the thing is, there are certain things that are in the second circle, primary prohibitions like alcohol, like zina. Those are big. And they belong where? In the second circle. And those Allah calls haram, doesn't he? And now you just called video games haram. Now, when you did that, you put those things that Allah made haram and the thing that you don't like on the same footing. So for a, for a young man, a young woman who's watching a movie, whatever, they're watching, I don't know, some, some stupid film. Watching movies is haram. I say, it's haram, but I watch it all the time. If it's haram, then I'm already in trouble. And I, since I watch a lot of movies, I'm in really deep trouble. But since I'm already in deep trouble, might as well try other haram. Because, I mean, I'm going to hell anyway, might as well go out with a party. So now since you put alcohol and listening to the radio and playing a video game on the same level, in the mind of the sinner, 
they became the same and video games is easy just no big deal you know watching a movie is no big deal and now zina became no big deal alcohol became no big deal drugs became no big deal so when we don't keep these priorities the way allah intended them then we start creating problems in society people think we're going to the more things we list haram the better it is for the people we're protecting the people let me tell you prophets protected people better than everyone else we cannot enhance what they did within limits of course the fuqaha will judge whether something is actually explicitly haram or not there can be things that are explicitly haram that didn't exist before they can be but it goes back to a major sin or it goes back to a violating a principle a fundamental principle of our religion you with me so far okay so this is the enhancements and even in the enhancements praying extra sunnahs mondays and thursdays of fasting doing the athkar visiting the grave you know doing the extra duas for entering leaving the home all the different things we do there's no disagreements there's no there are no disagreements If you want to become a better Muslim beyond the fundamentals, okay, go to the enhancements. Work on the enhancements, and add a little bit of an enhancement every day. Learn a little new du'a every day. That's what you should do. Then there's a circle outside of that, like outside of that. Okay, now there's this fourth circle. The fourth circle is issues on which the companions agreed. We don't find them in Quran. And by the way, these enhancements are pr- predominantly found in the Sunnah, right? The circle outside of that is things that the companions agreed on. It's called ijma al sahaba. Ijma means they agreed on, they had consensus. But actually, there's no such thing as all the companions agreed. That's oversimplification. There are three kinds of agreement. So when it, when the companions agreed, there are three kinds of agreement. Here's the first one. The first one is they agreed on an event. They agreed on an event. What does that mean? They all the the not all the companions attended Badr. Some people became Muslim after Badr, but the ones who attended Badr will tell you it started on this day. It lasted this long. We these were the supplies that we had. Why are they in agreement? Because they were all present. Got it? So this is why they are in agreement. Okay. The second kind of agreement is the agreement of the scholars among the sahaba the most knowledgeable among them sometimes they would all agree with each other ijma fuqaha is sahaba okay like the ibn abbas radiyallahu ta'ala anhuma is of the scholarly companions there are some other companions who don't know even a single surah they're new to islam they're like new muslims now they're like new muslims now we call them sahaba too but their agreement is not being part of this it's not part of this category this category is when the most knowledgeable of the companions agreed so what was the first one when they when they agreed on an event because they were all part of the same event the second one when the scholars among them agree the third one is when the governors among them agree ijma umara is sahaba when the like umar bin al-khattab and his advisors they all agreed on a particular rule a particular governance that's the third kind of agreement three kinds of consensus or agreement among the sahaba what are they again event the scholars and the governors when the governors when umar bin al-khattab decides something he doesn't consult every single sahabi there's thousands upon thousands upon thousands of them he has to take his advisory council and they have to make an agreement and they pass that verdict and they make that a policy and everybody else follows it you got it okay now this is agree now the the, the problem here i want to as we go i want to highlight problems what people do nowadays is they say all the sahaba agreed on da, 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 da. wait wait all the sahaba agreed where did you get that from well it's obvious like no where is it obvious it's in the books which books go read them you can't just throw these words out all the sahaba agreed you can't do that your your words have to be based on some evidence you can't just throw those out and people throw these words out like they say the the most the funniest things i've ever heard is all the scholars agreed on this like what okay name 10 of them uh all of them if you read tafsir you'll find there's no such thing as all the scholars agree It's so funny. I'm reading tafsir like Qurtubi, Tabari, Jalalain, Ibn Kathir, Ibn Ashur, you know, Ash-Shinqiti, and one of them will say, "Faqad ajma' al-ulama ala hada." Wa khalafahu wa khilafuhu nadir. The scholars agreed on this. 
and the opposition to this is very rare. The other mufassir will say, the scholar uh, uh, agreed on this, the opposite. And the opposition is very rare. Meaning for them even, agreement or majority is relative. Majority is relative. This requires a lot of study and a lot of depth. Sometimes the fuqaha of the sahaba, the, the smartest of the sahaba, the scholars among the sahaba had different opinions. They disagreed. They had you know, opposing opinions and that's okay. Where's the deen in absolute agreement? Where is there absolutely no disagreement whatsoever? First three circles. First three circles. When we preach, when we, when we stand on behalf of prophets and share, what's the primary thing we share? One and two. When people are within our wing, they're in our family, they're in our circle of friends, and they've already accepted the first and the second, then what do we work on? Then we work on three. And four is very specific to research and study. But you cannot start with four and say, that's Islam, everyone. You have to start where the Prophet started. You see what I'm saying? You have to start at one and two, and then move on to three, and then there's this outer circle, which is four. Now, were the Sahaba all unanimously in agreement on everything? No, they were in agreement on one, two, and three though. The Sahaba, if you want to call it ijma, if all the Sahaba agreed, it was actually on one, two, and three together. You with me? Now there's a circle outside of that. This is the coolest circle ever. This circle is actually of the Ummah agreeing on something. Or the, the what you, call, you can call it ijtihad. A scholar has a certain opinion. He has a fatwa. Okay, a scholar has a fatwa. The original opinion, the original thought process of scholars is important to understand. They knew that one and two and three are perfect. Four requires a lot of research to understand why they agreed on why they disagreed. By the time you get to five, there are some questions that the Qur'an doesn't seem to answer directly and the Sunnah doesn't seem to answer directly. There doesn't seem to be absolutely crystal clear, solid evidence that we should do this or that. Now I have to do my own research and I have to look at whatever text I can find, whatever evidence I can find, and then I have to come to a conclusion to the best of my ability. I'm going to try to find an answer to this question knowing already that my answer is not absolute because absolute ends with one, two, and three. So my answer is the best of my ability. It's not something I can impose on anyone else. I'll impose it on myself and if other people are convinced of the way I came to this conclusion, maybe they can follow it too. But I will not say this is Islam and if you don't follow this, it's not Islam. I can't say that. I can't say that my fatwa is actually binding on Islam itself. The most I can say is based on my understanding, I think this is how we should think about this. Could somebody else have a different understanding? Yes. And these are on issues in which the Quran and the Sunnah and the Sahaba are not explicitly clear. Okay? So I'll give you an example. Just one example. Dr. Akram, when he taught us this class, he gave us like a hundred examples. And my mind was already blown away after two examples. And he gave like 98 more overload. It's like drinking soda for 10 hours. Just, well, I'll give you just one. My, one of my favorite examples. Khalifa Harun al-Rashid. He was the head of state and he was the Amir al-Mu'minin. And back then, the Amir al-Mu'minin, the head of state, would also lead the prayer, especially at Hajj. Right? So he's performing Hajj. And who's going to be the Imam? The Amir al-Mu'minin is going to be the Imam. So he's in the first row. Obviously, why is he in the first row? Because he's going to lead the prayer. And he's Hanafi. He's from the Hanafi school. His muallim for Hajj, the one who was taking him to, to Hajj, you know, in Hajj you have a muallim who teaches you all the, the rituals. Obviously his muallim is going to be what school of thought? It's going to be Hanafi. It's Qadi Abu Yusuf, which is actually the founder of the Hanafi school. Imam Abu Hanifa's ideas are codified by Qadi Abu Yusuf. So he's the one who's his muallim. The biggest Hanafi scholar on the planet is his muallim for Hajj. And they're in the first row. And he's about to pray, lead the prayer. But 
uh, Khalifa uh, Harun al Rashid wants to do hijama. Do you guys know what hijama is? Cupping? When they, they, they draw the blood? Now, according to the Hanafis, if you bleed, your wudu breaks. And Harun al Rashid is a smart guy. He knows that if I ask Abu Yusuf, did my wudu break? What's he going to say? It broke. And if it broke, then I have to go through all the lines of Hajj to go make wudu. And on the way, take selfies and sign autographs. And then come all the way back. By the time I come back, it'll be Maghrib time. I need to lead prayer when? Right now. And if I ask Abu Yusuf, he's going to say, no, your salah doesn't count because you have no wudu. Imam Malik was in the first row. So Harun al-Rashid purposely decides not to ask his own muallim. He asks Imam Malik. Now the thing with the Malikis is that if you bleed, your wudu didn't break. And Harun al-Rashid knew that. So he asked Imam Malik, Hey, uh, did my wudu break? I just had cupping done. And he said, No, no. Your wudu didn't break. Please lead the prayer. And so Khalifa Harun al-Rashid leads the prayer. At at some masjid with three people there? How many people? Oh, it's Hajj! It's Hajj! Now Qadi Abu Yusuf is standing behind him. Imam Malik is standing behind him. Qadi Abu Yusuf is one of the biggest scholars in the world at the time. So he doesn't travel alone. He has legions of students with him that are doing Hajj with him. They're all standing behind him and they watched all of this happen and they're praying. And they finish praying and they run after Khalifa Harun Rashid. Uh, should we repeat our prayer? How did you allow him to lead the prayer at the Kaaba without wudu? And Qadi Abu Yusuf, who's what school of thought? Hanafi. He turns to his students and he says, anybody who dares to repeat their prayer is from the Khawarij. They're from outside this deen. Why did he say that? Because they had a different thought process when it came to fatwa. Their thought process was, look, there's nothing explicitly clear about bleeding and wudu breaking. It's something that has to be analyzed and extracted. To the best of our analysis, it breaks. To the best of the Maliki's analysis, it doesn't break. But you know what? At the end of the day, this is my analysis and this is his analysis, there is no ayah of the Qur'an that says bleeding breaks wudu. There is no hadith of the Prophet that says bleeding breaks wudu. So that we cannot argue that this is qawl and falsehood, it's a done deal. It's at the end of the day, the best of our analysis. Therefore, I don't know if I'm right and I don't know if he's wrong. And I am not willing to sacrifice what I know is a principle and the principle is brotherhood. The principle is in namal mu'minuna ikhwa. The principle is يُؤْثِرُونَ عَلَىٰ أَنفُسِهِمْ وَلَوْ كَانَ بِهِمْ خَصَاصًا I'm not willing to violate this principle to hold on to my fatwa. That was their attitude. That's how they, they classically this is how they thought. If you study the fuqaha, and I'm not a student of fiqh, and even if I am, I won't tell you. But if you study the fuqaha and they disagree with somebody, someone that they disagree with from a different school, they'll first have one page of dua for them. And then they will say why they disagree. And here's why I disagree. And then they, the other will respond and say, well, thanks for your dua, here's some dua for you, and here's why I disagree with you. They're not always that nice though. They're not always that nice. They're sometimes they really go at each other. You know, هذا أقبح ما قيل That's the ugliest thing that could have been said. They'll write things like that too. But these circles are important to understand because we need to understand how Islam is today with this map. What is our priority? Number one priority. Principles. Principles. Fairness. Justice. Consciousness of Allah. Honesty. Truthfulness. Prior these are priority. What teaches those principles? The fundamental obligations are supposed to reinforce those principles. What enhances those principles? The third circle. Now what we've become, most of our questions, most of our questions about Islam, they don't even belong to the fourth category. They belong to the fifth category and we've lost all side of the principles. When you, for example, have in the Quran, 
Allah says, describes people who love to be pure. And you go to Hajj. Hajj is a fundamental obligation. And it's supposed to virtually reinforce every single value inside of you. Taqwa, gratitude, remembrance of Allah, honesty, justice, all of it. You know, a, a, a care for people. It's the legacy of Ibrahim alayhi salam. And when you're standing in front of the Kaaba and you're trying to touch the black stone and people are willing to elbow you in the face and throw a grandma far away so they can touch it and another guy is willing to climb on top of five, six other people to get to touch Hijr Aswad so he can ask for a, you know, I don't know, a Lexus or something. And when he touches it, by the time he gets to it, only dua he should be making is, May Allah forgive me for what I just did. You know, like... <laughs> it seems that we have the rituals, but we don't have any recognition of the principles. When you have people walking in, in Muzdalifah, it's sacred land. It's sacred land. This is a land where you're supposed to just spend the night just making dua to Allah. To spend the night remembering Allah. And when you get out of Muzdalifa in the morning, you cannot take two steps. You don't remember whether you're standing in sacred land or in the middle of a, ma a land field where garbage is dropped. You cannot see the ground. All you see is diapers and water bottles and Coke, bo Coke cans and napkins. And you seen it? And I've seen it and I cried. I cried. I just... How, how, how did that happen? You know that happens when the ritual is left, but it's not tied to what? There's no principle left. There's no principle left. And that, then the religion that's supposed to be so beautiful, because everything goes back to the essentials, becomes ugly. That's how you take a beautiful religion and you make it ugly. That's what Bani Israel did. They took a religion that Allah gave them that was beautiful. All they had left was the rituals and it became ugly. Subhanallah. This is, a, a, to me, this, this, this framework was so important to understand. It was so valuable. Because we make a bigger deal out of things than they should be. Some of the biggest fights in the Ummah are how many taraweeh we should pray. Some of the biggest fights in the Ummah is global moon sighting or local moon sighting. Some of the biggest arguments in the Ummah, these, these things. And these things, when you go to the classical fuqaha, this is not even part of the third. This is fourth onwards. So why are you fighting? What unites us is so much more powerful what separates us. But you know the thing that unites us, when, when you no longer focus on it, then the only focus left is on things that separate us. And even today now, when a Muslim looks at another Muslim, they think, is he Shafi'i or? Is, is he Maliki or? Is he like me or no? Is he really? And you know, some people come to me, they're from Pakistan, so they really like me because I'm from Pakistan too. I'm happy, I like you too, because I'm from Pakistan, I love you, that's great. So I just wanted to make sure you're Hanafi, right? I was like, if I was, I wouldn't tell you. Well, why not? Well, I don't want to tell you because you shouldn't be thinking about that. You should just be thinking whether you're, you're Muslim or not. That's it. That's it. You know? And so... You know, th this was the first lesson that I covered with him that I found so amazingly beneficial. I'll leave you with the first thing he said. I'll, that'll be the last thing I tell you. It's my one of the most epic things I've ever heard. How many prophets were there? 124,000. Okay. Most important people in the world? Who? Prophets. Everybody agree with that? Okay. The greatest teachers for humanity are who? So these 124,000 some people are the most important teachers for all of humanity. Everybody agrees? Okay, name them. Uh, why? They're the most important people. You should know their names. Well, no, Allah didn't tell us their names. Allah only told us like 25. Yes? So there's a few missing? <laughs> these most important teachers of Islam we don't even know their names. Allah will not ask you who Abu Hanifa was. He will not ask you who Mama Shafi was. So okay, relax. This, when, if I say it, it doesn't mean anything. When one of the biggest Hanafi scholars in the world says it, I go, the, that was his first his introduction. I was like, we have to put things in the proper place first before we learn. So he started with that. 
Now, my last comments. Those were his first comments, and I made them my last comments. My own last comments are about uh, uh, the, how the Muslim mind works. I know this because my mind used to work this way. When you're growing up learning about Islam, sometimes you hear a story. Some barakat or some like, you know, this sheikh made this dua and then this happened and that happened. Or you have a story of the companions. Or you have a story of the prophets. Or you have this thing about this one gives you this many good deeds, that one gives you that many good deeds. Or if you do this, you get punished this way or that way. You've heard these things your whole life. Some of those things are from the Quran. Some of them are from the Sunnah. Some of them, we, nobody knows where they're from. Some of those are just stories. Some of those, and there's these different things. And in your head, there's this mixed ground salad of all of these things together and all of them are Islam together. You understand? But should it be separated? What is the word of Allah and the teachings of the Prophet ﷺ? And that should be in its place and you shouldn't mix this with other things. We shouldn't be mixed with other things. Why am I drawing these circles? So that when you think about Islam, you primarily think about the first three circles. And when you th hear anything else, you can put it in its proper place. And if you disagree from four, five, and six onwards, if you disagree with four, five, and six, that does not make us a divided ummah. That does not make us a divided ummah. Where is the unity of the ummah? One, two, and three. That's where the unity of the ummah is. We don't have to all have the same fiqh. We don't have to pray witr the same way. We don't have to pray the same number of taraweeh. We don't have to do that. We don't have to have the same fatwas on all the issues. We don't. That doesn't make us a divided ummah. We can pray different days on Eid. We're still going to be one ummah. Because we're united by something far more powerful. But when all of these things are mixed together, then all you see is division. Then that's all you see. May Allah Azza wa Jal make us a united ummah in the genuine sense of the word. And may Allah Azza wa Jal give us the right sense of priorities in our religion. Barakallahu li wa lakum. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah.